Hey guys, thanks for coming to hang out here on the sessions. A friendly reminder that you can hang out with me in more than one place because I'm also on AMP. Just download the app, come hang out with us Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Let's get a little more sessions in your life. We all need it. Guys, here in the sessions, I am joined by Pueo Del Mar. You look just ravishing. How long does it take you to put this look together? Well, you know that you barely gave me any time to prepare for this. It's <laughs> chapstick and mascara, Renee. That's all I got. That's on. me. <laughs> That's me right now. I'm chat. I did put on a little baby <laughs> lash for you. But I'm wearing a hat, so I don't really know who I thought I was proving something to by putting on a lash under the hat, but I put in an effort. You know what? The the thing about you is that you're so radiant uh, to begin with. Uh, you really are. You are very radiant. I told you that on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, we all are aware of how like talented you are at everything you do. But I saw you recently on a broadcast of AEW Dynamite and I don't know if it's because you get to work with your husband or you like the atmosphere or you're just doing what you love, but you were absolutely glorious. Oh, I don't you know what it, you know, it. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, I just cut my hair all off. That makes me feel myself for sure. Chopping my hair off is like such a liberating moment for me. I feel like I cut it and I was like, oh, who wants to come get some bitches? Let's go. <laughs> right. and, well, I think that little things like that, I mean, I'm very fortunate because I can literally have whatever hair I want today. Yes, you, know I mean? you can. As could you, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> we all know. could. You I just got to commit. But I know the wig game is no joke. I mean, they're very expensive, aren't they? Well, yes. I, I know there's like a wide variety from, you know, A to Z in terms of monetary value placed, placed on these, but they can get very steep. Well, this one is a custom creation. I ha I have uh, somebody that I go to for most of my customs. This one is a custom Bobby Friday production. That's one of my drag kids, somebody I love and adore. And oh, someone has... I feel like I've heard that name before, Bobby Friday. Do you do wigs yeah. for other people that I know? Maybe, but if they don't now, this is the problem. This is one of the re reasons. Can you maybe just do Mercedes Monet's new when she debuted at uh, New Japan. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think oh, so. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Anyways, so, I don't know. I'm talking out my ass. But one of the things I will tell you when you are kind of, when you are a creation of an entire, it takes an entire team of people to pull together the vision that I have for myself. And one of the reasons I do not love sharing some of those super talented people that I work with um, is because next thing I know, all the people who are much more famous than I am or could ever <laughs> aspire to be are going to that person. And there's and like, Hey, remember me? I'm the one who like gave you your business sort of. Yeah. So it, no, you got to put that under lock and key, like lock it up, throw away the key. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to keep that close to the vest. I respect that. You know, you can't see it because I'm it's underneath like my denim couture here, but I'm wearing like another custom creation that I wore last year at Effie's Big Gay Brunch is, is this, custom Dallas Cowgirls cheerleader Ooh, outfit. Love. And I discovered this really amazing person to do my costuming. And the very first time I wore one of their pieces at NWA, I walk into the dressing room and I'm not even kidding, like Mickey, Chelsea, and <laughs> swoop on me. Like, Moths to a down. flame. <laughs> and it, was, it wasn't even, I mean, five minutes later, they had were already DMing the person. And I was just like, you guys, like, get out of my way. Famous. Give me a break. Like, you could buy something sort of off the rack. I'm a size like 18 in you a very get it made. Spring. You gotta get it made. We love a little, a little bodacious bod. Okay, this look, how long does it take you to put this together? I want like a full rundown. So I would say that to do I love to take my time for me makeup is meditative yes I think that that was one of the biggest transformations in my personal career in, in on this journey because it went from being something that was necessary to something I love and I like to like sit and take my time and for something very important like this I spent almost three hours like Ooh. just just you know because it's like I stop and I look and then I fix and I the thing is 
I can, I found that some of my best makeup looks are done in like really short period of time because it's just like, got to get it done. And if Do I it. allow myself too much time, then I'll start to like nitpick it too and, much. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll be destroying something good. <laughs> Do you feel exhausted by the end of it or does the meditative aspect of it pump you up that you're the like ready to go? Yeah, the meditation allows me to sort of center. You know, I mm -hmm. start to like get my thoughts. And sometimes it's not even like, it's not necessarily even quiet. Like right before we did this, I had to turn off some like murder shows. There's only two things in the whole world <laughs> that I watch legitimately. It's pro wrestling and true crime. Perfect. So, I mean, which is why one of the reasons I love, for example, like the Dark Side of the Ring so much, right? It's like sort yeah, of- Yeah, excellent. Genres. Great programming. But for me, like it, it allows me to center and sort of- and. And not only that, but there is this, as I'm physically beginning to transform, I think mentally I start to transform too. Yes. It's one of the reasons I do not love to have to do all of this like super early in the morning because I haven't even felt centered as a person yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden I have to put that, in, like compartmentalize it. It's like, oh God, you got to go away. You, you no, I get that. Like I get hours. that. It, it takes a while to kind of like get into like, even like, from like a performance aspect to like mentally get to where you need to be. Sometimes you just, you need a second. It's not for all hours of the day. I it's respect true. that. I can respect that. And my, my experience with this, I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this for yeah. like eight, almost 18 years, I think. And oh. it's one of those things where like I can, I, so I was meticulous today with my makeup and even though I liked the way it looked, it's not done until the lashes go on. It's not. No, I, no, no. No one's done until the lashes on. That's a exactly. fact. Exactly. And then I look in the mirror and I was like, ooh, there she is. Ooh, you are a bad bitch, Miss <laughs> Poyo Del Mar. Ooh, you truly are the lovely Poyo Del Mar. <laughs> okay. You've been doing this for 18 years. Yes. I want to go to like the starting point and go through some of like the different transformations that you have made as a drag queen, how the drag community has changed in those 18 years. There's a ton to dissect there. Um, I would like yeah. to go to, to getting into the drag world. How did that sort of pique your interest? Um, yeah. So, how did you, how'd you dip your toes? I'll say this. I think that for me, I've always enjoyed I've, you know, so interestingly enough, I think there's a, such a correlation between this and pro wrestling because everything is pro wrestling. Everything is. I literally just put out, um, like I just put out stickers that are called, it says pro wrestling is drag because people, <laughs> yeah, for me, drag is about transformation and it doesn't matter if it's like uh, male to female transformation or female to male, or just, I mean, because if you look through my catalog of makeup, sometimes I'll do like aliens or sure. like I'll you know, kind of cosplay type of stuff. I love yeah. that. But I've always been drawn to like the drama and the glamour of pro wrestling. And so when I look back on the the people that inspired me in pro wrestling early on, and when I felt like as, as a younger person, I felt the door of pro, entering pro wrestling was closed on me. And so I think I saw- Wait, other... why did you think that it was closed on you? Because, because I grew up in an era where there were no obvious LGBTQ representation. Right. Where there was, um, when the way LGBTQ plus people were presented was demoralizing mm -hmm. or humiliating um, as the butt of jokes, things like that. So mm -hmm. for me, I probably would have fully entered wrestling at the age of 18 when that opportunity first presented itself. But I felt so uncomfortable with myself. That was another part of it. It didn't matter what the outside world was telling me. I didn't feel comfortable with myself. Yeah. I didn't feel good about who I was. And I specifically didn't feel good about who I was in relation to the world of professional wrestling, where I thought there was such an, a different expectation for who I had to be to be successful or to be accepted. It's so, so funny to think of that, too, because I think... Just as wrestling has changed in general over the course of the last 20 years and like, you know, even more so in the last 10 specifically. But I think for anybody, whether it's the LGBTQ plus community, whether you were just a smaller guy looking to break into the business, Absolutely. the way that we've had more indie wrestlers, the way that women's wrestling has changed. I think it's just gotten so much more inclusive and it, it's so cool to see that that people have so much more different representation to now see themselves as different characters on television and see those different opportunities because you're right it didn't exist before and i will point this out to renee that 
when we look back to, for example, the WWF, which even in the, when I, as a kid, it was like the largest of the promotions that was out there. Yeah. Before it was WWE. When we looked at a great deal of minority representation in that company, everybody played and it was, it was, the, yeah. yeah, it was, it was also like, it was part of the time because everybody was some kind of a stereotype. Everybody like had their, their like form of employment as their gimmick. Like I'm a plumber, <laughs> I'm a, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm I, a IRS, yeah. So, but at the same time, like many, many of the people who were of any minority were represented as an absolute stereotype of that you know like the the whether you're latino or you're black i mean like we can go through it like you're from samoa you must be like a raw meat eating savage you yeah. are um, yeah you're, you know yeah and so for me that like would Low i low hanging fruit always absolutely mm -hmm. and and it was always used in some bizarre way to draw heat from the audience <laughs> you know like yeah yeah we're, we're gonna play to your absolute lowest common denominator of humanity mm -hmm. and all of the horrible things you might think about people who are other than you sure so that brings me i guess of course to but i want like to get the... back to so the the oh, drag of, no you asked i was like i just wanted to answer the question like the the drag to me was uh like i'm theatrical i'm like you know and so that is was something that was I was drawn to and then little did I know that you know 10 years later it would circle me back into this world in a in completely different way that I than I had ever imagined so your love of pro wrestling comes before your love of drag my love of pro wrestling um started when I was probably like seven okay. you, know I mean? I, yeah. you know and I didn't start doing drag for many many years after that but I would tell you that Interestingly enough, my earliest things that attracted me to pro wrestling were the people who basically were in drag, like Austin Idol and Ric Flair, and <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like all of these elaborate robes and the sparkles and the bedazzles. And I'm like, ooh, give me some know. of that. Give me a little razzle dazzle. Have you always been San Francisco based? Do you grew up in San Francisco? I moved here when I was um, heartbroken after one of my first big love affairs. I've been here for over 20 years now. Okay. So this is really my home. This is where this came about. And it is where I have laid roots. I've actually lived here in San Francisco longer than I've lived anywhere else in the world. It's home. That's that's home. home. One, but where did you grow up, grow up like as a kid? I was born in Ohio. And, oh, I didn't know you were in Ohio and where? Um, I was born in Van Wert, Ohio. Okay. So, I, I don't know why I only know Cincinnati and like Cleveland. I don't really know anything, but right. well, so I live I, here now. I, so of course you know Cincy. So Cincy's at the bottom of the state. Cleveland's in the upper, yeah. um, you know, right hand. And then I was born in the upper. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the upper left hand. If you're looking. Okay, at this. got um, it. And I went to college in Cleveland. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not just glamorous. I have two degrees. So. Wait, what know, are your degrees in? <laughs> broadcasting and political science. I was. <laughs> I. I went to college. This is. I've been talking about this a lot lately, and I think it's because people think when you look like this, that you're an idiot or something. I don't know. But I went to college. I initially was a pre-law major with a broadcasting secondary degree. And I had been accepted into a master's and law program. I was going to go on and become an, I was going to get my master's in broadcast communication and my JD so that I could become- You could have been the new Judge Judy. I wanted to be an entertainment attorney. Like I wanted to, to okay. like, hey, you know, and then I like when I started to really get into the practical part of that, I'm like, why in God's name would I want to write out <laughs> page contracts for somebody else when I have all the skills and talents to be the star? I could write my own talent, you know. Contract. Yes, you could have been the new Judge Joe Brown. That was one, right? Yes, that was my grandfather's. <laughs> yeah. I okay, wait. Judge Draggy. So <laughs> I would watch that. I feel like there is a space for that to happen. I love that. Very you know, I niche, that but degree, I like it. But I never got that degree, Renee, but trust me, I judge a lot still. I'm sure. <laughs> Who doesn't? Were you doing drag when you were in Ohio before you got to San Francisco? Oh, God, no. You know, never. <laughs> I actually did wrestling in Ohio. Um, you did? Or, yes. Believe it or not, that's a little in part of my history. I'd started out... Um, I was, God, I'm so old. Um, there was a time on public access television where there was a program that broadcast in Cleveland that was called Masters of Mayhem. And it was a public access 
broadcast from a company called Great Lakes Wrestling Association. And they had a, a guy there whose name was Psycho Mike. He was the big, you know, the promoter and booker. Mm-hmm. And they just had it was so random because they just had a phone number like, you want to get involved? Call. And <laughs> I was in my dorm room and I called at 18 and uh, met with the guy and talked to him. And I did two gigs as a manager when I was like 19 years old. Oh my God. And they strapped me with a terrible gimmick. And I was working with two people who were like, What was your gimmick? Oh my God. I can't. This <laughs> is a question nobody has ever asked. So um, I was partnered with a guy that was called the bounty hunter and i was the bail bondsman oh. I was, oh God, oh. was so hideous. um i was the bail bondsman and we were out collecting bounties you know like we people and the unfortunate thing as i said is i wasn't comfortable with myself in that environment and, right and so i was so very young and i was put in this environment where you know one of the people i was working with um, I don't know where they are now or if you, they're even alive because it was so long ago. But one of them was like profoundly um, dependent on alcohol, it seemed, to be able to mm-hmm. perform. And, like, okay. Th- we only did two shows together, but he was so intoxicated both times. It was very uncomfortable for me. Yeah. So I left that world for a few years, finished my degree. And with my broadcasting degree, I came back and I actually re you know joined that company. And I became one of their broadcast colleagues, sort of like okay. on our okay public access show interesting but I never to like dip your toes okay so you weren't doing drag in ohio what what brought you to san francisco well you said the heartache heartbreak yes and a job job. okay okay no i was young and i got my heart broken and i just could not i think that people probably can relate to this i love a motivator that'll do it i just couldn't go out in like our small environment and run into this person who every time we saw each other, I just felt crushed. Mm. And I had visited California on my birthday that, that this is, oh my God, 1999. Wow. And um, I had visited California on my birthday in 1999 and I came home and I just announced to my roommate, like, yeah, I'm going to move to California. And he was like, okay, so, and I don't think he thought I was so serious, but Literally six weeks later, I was like, all my belongings were being towed across the country. And I had an apartment that I rented sight unseen. And so that's just- the way to do it. I did something very similar when I was like, I'm just going to go to California. I had packed my bags. I bought mm-hmm. a ticket. And somehow my, my mom was actually taking a flight to like Halifax to go visit my grandparents at the time. And the woman sitting next to her knew a friend of a friend that had a room that they were renting out. And I was like, great, I'll take that. And I just like packed up and I left. Doing shit on no notice is like the baller move, the way to do it. Just go and fucking do it. Don't overthink it. Much like the makeup. <laughs> Let's not overthink it. Let's just fucking knock it out of the park. That's you know, the way to do it. I have done some of those things that when we start to, like, when we start to rationalize things, I mean, I'm not suggesting this for all things in life, and I know you aren't either. No. But sometimes you just have to be like, you assess what's going on with you and you're like, what is actually keeping me here? Yeah. Like, what is it that's Especially when you're here? young and oh, you're yeah. figuring yourself out and the world's just so big. There's all these opportunities. Like it's so fun to get outside of your comfort zone. You really kind of like test yourself to see what you're made of. It's very fun. I couldn't do that now. I'm too old to do that now, but. And you also, when you're so <laughs> young like that, like you really don't have those things. Like There's no stakes. Family, kids, you know, whatever. Yeah. And you, like, Worst case scenario, I just go back and I like totally. I told myself that like I'm gonna go to San Francisco. I actually wanted to go to San Diego, but there was just no opportunity there. And I'm glad of I ended. Of course, yeah. But it's like if I go and in six months I still hate it, I'm just gonna go back. And it took me like four months to not hate it here. Uh, because I was scared and I just was mm-hmm. lonely. You don't know anybody. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was just like, you know what? I'm okay with this. And it's expensive. That's a little bit scary too. It's far more expensive to be out there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I remember that I was sharing this huge house with a roommate in Cleveland. And when I moved to San Francisco, my room that I was renting was more than the whole house was. Of course. I had to get a second job. And it was like, you know, but it was, I was young and I had a lot of energy and I could do that, I guess. I don't know. I want you to tell me about your first drag experience of like going to a drag bar or going to a show. Did you know what you were getting yourself into by like, a t- like what kind of sparked the flame for you to ignite that like passion to go, Ooh, I want to dabble in this. 
Well, my first drag shows ever were in Cleveland. Okay. You know, and it's a very small community there. Um, very, it's, it's something that also, I would say this, like people outside uh, uh, the, of our community, my community, I don't think always understand the delineation between drag and like being transgender or drag and sexual identity, gender identity, sure. all those things. And when I was growing up in the Midwest, drag was not exclusive to, but largely populated by people who were what I consider transgender showgirls, like they were transgender and that was their form of employment because there were no other real opportunities for them besides mm -hmm. things that were potentially nefarious or dangerous or illegal. Yeah. And so it was something I loved to watch, but it was something that I never thought was actually a real thing for me. And then I came to San Francisco and the, the drag scene here was so much more eclectic. It was enormous in terms of the scope of different types of drag, the different mm -hmm. opportunities to perform, the venues to perform. Um, and one of the things that I, that really resonated with me when I first started is was super punk rock. Like you yeah, didn't yeah. look or present female. You could just like be very David Bowie or you could be a little I mean, more androgynous with it. Yes. You know, yeah. so it was a situation that was a lot more embracing to me. And then as I progressed, my love and passion for it grew and my skills grew. Then I started to realize like, oh, I could do uh, things that would make me appear much more feminine or, and it's not my, it's not my identity. You know what I mean? This isn't my identity. This is my, this is a character that I play that I love dearly. I feel very like, you know, connected to it because I've infused into this character so many people that I grew up admiring and loving and appreciating. Who are so, some of those people? Oh my gosh. Um, some people that I've infused into this character um, in general, Miss Piggy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> Miss Piggy. I mean, come on now. The ultimate, she's like, Agreed. she'll to protect her man. She's Miss Piggy sassy. knows what she wants. Yes. yes. Don't take no shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so Miss Piggy was definitely one. I think that some elements of inspiration I drew also from just pop culture, um, people like like the character of Wonder Woman played by Linda Carter on television, Farrah Fawcett. Mm -hmm. These were all people that were to me just like iconic and legendary. Anna Nicole Smith is actually- Oh yeah. Anna Nicole Smith is actually the basis for everything like in terms of my physical presentation. Um, also a big part of the persona that I portray Mm -hmm. in um in the nwa and the national wrestling alliance dolly parton obviously somebody and then when i look more closely at, at my personal life like there there's this funny story from dolly parton where she talks about how when she was growing up she didn't realize it but she came to idolize the town floozy basically okay and her mom said um dolly you know stay away from her that that woman is nothing but trash. <laughs> and Dolly says, all I saw was like her glamorous hair, all her big makeup, the way her clothes looked. And I thought to myself right then, oh my God, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be trash. <laughs> yes. So um, to me, I like, I remember there's this woman, God bless her. There's this woman, I'm calling her out now, a woman named Bernice who was like, the town floozy when I was growing up. And I just thought she was the most beautiful. Bernice. She looked like she, I, Bernice does not sound like the name of somebody who would be super hot, but <laughs> then she was like the person that I thought should was too beautiful for our small town. She should be in Hollywood, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that, but in the world of professional wrestling, you know, I've loved wrestling for so long that it truly influenced me. Baby doll. I say these names all the time because they are, baby doll, Nicola Roberts, who is, I'm so blessed to consider a friend and a mentor now and work with in the mm -hmm. National Wrestling Alliance on occasion. Um, Missy Hyatt, mm -hmm. Dark Journey, um, who recently reached out to me because I've been working with Bobby Fulton and Bobby Fulton and, and Dark Journey are very good friends. They've you know been around the industry for years together and she's since left the industry, but he connected us in Dark Journey and Missy Hyatt's feuds throughout the South were everything to mm -hmm, me mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then 
we move over to like WWF and there is nobody greater than Sherry Martel. You know, oh, there is yes. greater in my mind than Sherry Martel. And for me as a character, I want to be exactly what for the modern era Sherry was to me. Like she was this chameleon and she could just more from like whoever she was with that, you know, she would become the next person, you know, whether she was um, by herself or whether she was with Shawn Michaels, Ted DiBiase, you know, Macho Man. We mm -hmm. saw her go through all of these people, a Harlem Heat, you know, like she just was able to morph and change. I wish we had like more of that in wrestling now. Like that really is a role that kind of doesn't exist that much anymore. Like I, I wish we had more of that because when you have someone that really can add and elevate an act, it makes such a huge difference. And we just, we don't, I don't know if it's just like so much value has been put on the wrestling aspect of things. We want these matches and these five-star matches and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, I love the characters too. And like being able to have like those interesting dynamics and what that adds to the storytelling to me, that's just like, Ooh, sweet spot stuff. So let's take a look historically because I agree with you so wholeheartedly. Do we, as a populace of wrestling fans, look back on wrestling history and talk about like, Oh, I remember this match. It was so legendary the match was so incredible i was yes of course we do but the number of matches that we look back on with that fondness whether they were five star or three star in our mind they won our hearts yeah number of those matches as compared to characters who captivated and enthralled us the the number the characters outweigh the matches yeah. tenfold yeah. and in this generation, one of the things I do unfortunately feel can be lost in translation is there are tons of people who are putting on like potentially legendary matches. Mm -hmm. But when your entire card is filled with potentially legendary matches and they all start to sort of blur mentally one into the, the next. Sure, I agree. The way, like the characters that you love. Yeah. So, no, I agree with you 100% on that because, yeah, I mean, kind of like what I was saying, too, is like you can have all of these amazing matches and there's so many great wrestlers. And I think the the art form of wrestling has changed and adapted and grown so much again in the last 10, 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. But it really is. It's, it's those characters. It's those moments that make you feel something like I always say I always come back to like Goldust, who is my favorite wrestler I that I just that. fell in love with. I mean, you must love some gold. Dust. I have multiple figurines right behind <laughs> me. Of course I do. So early or oh, wait, not way, put in a good word with me for Dustin. I like, oh, I met him when he was 19. He's exceptional. First ever interview, believe that or not. Wow. As, a, as like, the natural. Like before he was only, it was only a second match, Renee. We met at a flea market. Don't give me that. Wow. Much um, but yes. <laughs> like, oh my God. I'm, I became obsessed with that character. So great. I mean, one of my favorite matches of all time is the Hollywood backlot brawl. I mean, you see Roddy Piper and Gold Dust and like the storytelling they were doing them to his characters. I mean, obviously, you know, they're two of the best as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, I, I agree. I, I love character work. I love stuff like vignettes. I love when people are getting married at a wrestling show. I live for that shit. I love it. I know wrestling purists are like, oh, I just want the matches and I want this technical shit and da da da. Like, yes, of course, hats off. I want to get into like the character stuff though. Right. And doesn't it make you more, this is like a rhetorical question, but doesn't it make you, the viewer, more invested in the outcome of the matches if yes. you actually understand who these people are why this match might be important to them what their motivation is you need, what's a, you, need a, you need to attach the emotion to it you have to Absolutely. oh my god i have a, a twitch stream where we all we watch is old school pro wrestling and last night um we were watching a match um actually it wasn't last night it was two nights ago we watched this match for, for me is like such a legend it is rick the model martel versus Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 92. Sherry looks iconic. Shawn looks iconic. <laughs> Rick Martel looks iconic. But And the, this is a great match between two obviously very skilled technical wrestlers. They could have gone out there and given us like a, you know, a masterclass in this. Mm -hmm. But the story of that match is that they've had a, a building rivalry where model the model is flirting with Sherry. Is Sherry intrigued? 
She's here with Sean. They've laid, they've made the, the gimmick of the match that you can't hit each other in the face. And the match is actually very technically sound, mm -hmm. but the match is completely defined by a moment where they are starting to gear up and they're going to hit each other in the face and <gasps> Sherry passes out. <laughs> she faints because she just can't bear the thought of them hitting each other in their beautiful faces and falls on to the ring apron only to be revealed that she's so enamored with the thought of these men fighting over her that she's trying to manipulate this. That is legend. That is legendary. <laughs> God, I, mean, I need to jump on one of these Twitch streams with you. It sounds like a great time. Great oh God, viewing God. party. I, I think that people join me on those Twitch streams because I have this passion for wrestling that extends well. When I say like I do old school streams, people will be like, oh, I love the Attitude Era. And I'm like, honey, that was- We're a going, yeah, that's, in that's modern office. era as far as we're concerned. Me too. I'm like, I'm looking at the 80s. We were streaming stuff, stuff last night from the late 70s. These are things that when I, and I get to talk to my viewers on there and explain to them and claim my place as a wrestling historian. Like this is what leads to this, which leads to this. And you'll ultimately you know, know all of these things because- yeah. These characters evolve from this location to somewhere else. In history of wrestling really is so important. That was one thing that I really realized when I jumped into the world of wrestling of how like, you know, even if you like dip out for a little bit and you're not paying attention to things like the stories that kind of circle back together or how things overlap or things harken back to things that happened, you know, however many years ago or whatever. It's, it's all just layered on top of each other. And I think like understanding the history of pro wrestling it's kind of essential to being a fan, I would say. And it enriches the experience too. Yeah. Because also, now I know what that thing means and I know why that guy stole that move and da 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 da. Precisely. Or even things that are like maybe frustrating to some people, but kind of a fun nod, like a wink and a nod, like almost mm -hmm. like an Easter egg in wrestling yeah. where, where you're, people are like, oh, this is like a, it's homage to that match from, you know, back then between these two people. Oh, this is a similarity to shows a similarity to this story that I saw here. And it yeah. kind of makes you feel not, I don't want to say like you feel like a smarty pants, but you feel it feels you're in on it. You're like it, in on the gag. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're part of it and you understand and it, and it layers the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Again, Everything is wrestling. Wrestling is great. We all love it. <laughs> um, okay. Going back to the drag world, because there are many other questions that I have for you about this. And of course, getting into um, some of the temperature, uh, gauging your temperature and some of the stuff that's happening currently right now. Um, but so your first experience, how much has your character changed from day one to who you are now? Let's just start there. <laughs> physically it's a complete 180 yeah i mean i you know not unlike anybody who would start out um practicing some kind of an art form i was pretty dreadful like people what was the first outfit oh god the first outfit my first outfit was actually pretty cute as i recall um and it was a fun it was a, it was fun. I don't even remember the exact specifics of it, but my story is that I did this charity event in drag for the first time as Poyo Del Mar. And I happened to go out to a nightclub afterwards because we'd spent so long doing my makeup. I was like, I'm not going to let this go to waste. As I told you, in a previous <laughs> yeah. interview, I'm not letting this go to waste. Yeah. And so I went to this nightclub and I had never met anybody really there. I walked in, but I was tall. I was blonde at the time, you know, for that moment. Um, and the host saw me from stage, called me up on stage and literally plucked me out of the audience, asked the audience if they would like to see me perform in the future. And I became a regular cast member in that show. I was legitimately pulled out of an audience and that's how my career started. So Within what, six months, that was paying my bills. What was the first performance then? Because I imagine I could be wrong, please correct me if I am, but to, to transform into the character while also figuring out what exactly your act is. I mean, those are two things that you really have to marry together, right? Yeah, I, for a performance, it's a, there's a lot of that. Like, you know, later on, it became when you just stand and lip sync, which there's a big difference. Like the 
back then I was doing stuff that was much more akin to performance art. So there would be like almost like a mini theatrical event happening behind the lip sync. Okay. And the first song was Jimmy James Fashionista. I remember that. It's a nobody knows that song, but it's a very club hit. <laughs> Jimmy James himself, uh, kind of a draggy icon. <laughs> and so there was that. And then my very first paid performance at that nightclub I was just mentioning was an homage to Anna Nicole Smith. And it was hopelessly devoted to you. And it was this whole production where, um, you know, she starts out as a Texas girl in a chicken shack or whatever, where she gets plucked from obscurity to become a Playboy model. And then, so there was these things like, you know, I started the performance like with the chicken shack thing. And um, then it went through this whole thing where it was like, you know, they lifted a banner behind me that made me look like I was posing in front of a Playboy magazine and a yeah. guest ad. And then, um, you know, I was uh, hopelessly devoted to the those pills. Remember, she was on the trim spot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I was hopelessly devoted to the elderly man. And I had a photo of them, which I literally just threw away that fo frame photo from <gasps> eight Oh, my frame gosh. Photo of Anna Nicole Smith with her elderly husband and then his will and then his tombstone. <laughs> the end. She's hopeless. Oh my all. gosh. All that in like three minutes. Epic. It's so great. Um, attending drag shows is is so much fun. The crowd that it drums up, being able to see the different talents, the different outfits that are put together, the way the makeup is done, you know, the performance aspect of it. So great. How hard is it for you? Like you talked about getting into Pollo Del Mar. Mm -hmm. turning into her um what about taking it all off is there a whole process that comes with that and like emotionally kind of disconnecting because I feel like you're talking about the character of Pollo Del Mar and how you are just playing a character but it is still you it is it's me um with the volume turned as epic as I can make it you know yeah and I will tell you I often because of the 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 volume being so high, I reference performing or being this character as um, when you have your cell phone and you have the brightness turned all the way up, <laughs> yeah. the, bat the battery runs dead much faster. Sure. You know, draining. And then once the battery gets to zero, it takes a lot longer to get it back recharged. That's how I feel afterwards, which is why when you layer like the drag, the character, and then like doing television tapings for wrestling or something Ooh. on top of it, Afterwards, like I'm like I'm on running on adrenaline, and then I get on that plane to come home, and I'm asleep. And then as soon as I get home, I'm asleep. And then <laughs> two days later, I'm like waking up to finally unpack my bags or whatever. But the the physical element of it comes off very quickly. Like I could, you we could be you could set a timer, and I could literally have all this off, um, showered and back looking completely different in five minutes. I'm sure impressive uh, because very that's impressive. that's years of doing it right. But the what I call is the drag hangover. The person, okay. the personality remains even after everything else is gone. And there are times when I will tell people like, now, if you want to have a, like a conversation with me that doesn't involve that persona, you need to wait a few minutes. Like you're going to have to come <laughs> back to me tomorrow because yeah. I'm still going to be, not that I'm not normally sassy or this or that, but when I've just been doing this, like I'm on on you know what well, you have to be it's part of the you game. can't just slam the brakes then no. yeah everything will go flying forward in the car we cannot do that we must ease <laughs> into Absolutely. hitting those brakes um Absolutely. what is your relationship with Poyo Del Mar to me she is the she is my superhero she's my superpower and I say that because there are elements of who I am underneath this and aside from this that occasionally lack confidence or where I second guess myself or I am uncertain about my interactions in capacities. There's a lot of humanity that's underneath this. There's a real person yeah. underneath this. And this is not that. This is my battle armor. This is, I, I am not Clark Kent anymore. I am Wonder Woman. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. Diana Prince. I'm Superman. So this is for me that, and I, I have a healthy respect for that. Uh, there are times when I, like, I call on this personality, even when I'm not like this, I'm like, okay, I need to like have all the, the guts 
You need to put on your Sasha Fierce. Is that what she called her when Beyonce turns into her character? Yes, Sasha Fierce. Sasha Fierce. Yes. Yes, exactly. I need to, I need to, I need to do that. And that is my relationship with it. But the other part of the relationship with it is that I try to separate my like so a lot of my relationships from this because this is something that is not sustainable like i just told you this is yeah. the personality the energy the the all of those things are not sustainable and also they are not um always 100 authentic because they're it's through the lens of this you know the relationship is through the lens of this so i try to temper that it's no different actually then what I found for most professional wrestlers, for example, who have fans who want to interact with that persona. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm, I'm not always not where that. I'm at right now. Yeah. Not where I'm, you're not going to get that person. That's not where I'm at. Yeah. It's a lot. You're, you're right. It's just, it's hard to maintain that and coming in and out of that character is uh yeah, that emotional and energy build up to, to let down. Um, so another quick question on this, because I was thinking about this earlier. I actually should have asked you at the beginning of the episode. But when you were in Pueyo Del Mar, I refer to you as she, her, right? And then when you're not in character, he, him. Yes, that's correct. Because okay. so this character is she, her. It's a her, it's a it's a woman. You know, I'm a yeah. your average ordinary little southern girl, honey. That's all my <laughs> country girl. There she is. But the person that I am is he him and that's where i was saying a lot of people don't understand the delineation between drag and gender identity like for me this is um a performative event it's not my identity but i still want you to respect the character because the character when it exists exists um for other people whether no matter how they present that's how they I, they may identify in a different way mm -hmm. and what I often tell people ask that a lot. And I've had some really interesting conversations in wrestling locker rooms where people come up and they're like, uh, and I'm always so appreciative that people will take that 30 seconds of time where they are uncomfortable. They're, they're choosing to be uncomfortable for 30 seconds to ensure that I am able to be comfortable yeah. and be re mutually respectful. And that's what it's really about just mutual respect. And it just literally takes a question. So it's funny I, I, how 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 much that how asking questions can make people very uncomfortable. I guess it's nobody wants to say the wrong thing or they're trying not to offend. But honestly, I feel like having the open dialogue just makes everything so much better. It's not easy to do sometimes, but it's the it's, move. It, you know, it's not easy, but it's the you know like that sort of translates into a lot of areas of life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. um it, from something as simplistic as like um, interactions in public where, you know, would you like salt on those fries? Like, you know, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> yeah. do, like when you're um, in a new relationship you're, and it's like, does that feel good? You know, yeah. like, yeah. or does this bother you? Yeah. Like if I, you know, like people who are smokers, like, oh, am I bothering you? Like, you know, does this bother you? Because I can move over here to better accommodate you. Or, hey, like, I'm not as like, hey, I don't smoke marijuana. So I'm going to just so you know, I'm like, it's not a you're not offending me, but I'm going to go over here because I don't like that or whatever the case may be. It's just a simple question to allow two people to be comfortable in their interactions. Certainly, certainly. No, I and it's cool that people do take that second to ask and just, yeah, let's all just be on the same page here. Everybody have the conversation. Um, okay. So getting into a, another um, interesting kind of conversation here, uh, which I kind of mentioned a little bit ago, but talking about um, this new law that is trying to be passed to limit drag shows in different States and how Our this is all have been passed. They have been passed. Um, yes. What's, what's your reaction to this i mean i would love to just give you the platform to to say your piece so um there's a there's a this is a layered conversation too and one of the things that i always have stated outwardly since i especially since i moved into the world of professional wrestling is like um i like to be a peacekeeper like i like to make nice and show respect for everybody and like we don't have to love the same things right mm -hmm. um but unfortunately 
literally who I am and what I do has been politicized. You know, yeah. like I've become politicized by other people's choices. Mm -hmm. And I want to share first my reaction when I first heard that the the this legislation had passed in Tennessee. I was with the National Wrestling Alliance. We were in Tampa. We were getting ready to do a big pay-per-view event there. I'm surrounded by people I love that I've been working with for almost a year. We we have a very good time together. You know, as well as I do, when you have been like away from your wrestling family for a while, when you get back together, it's like a family reunion. Everybody's mm -hmm. having a good time. And everybody's doing this. And I get a text message um, that says, hey, did you see this legislation had passed? And I struggled with sharing this on a public level because to me, it's a little bit embarrassing. But um, I left that super supportive environment, went upstairs to my hotel room, and I cried and I prayed and I cried because I thought it was sad. I cried because I was fearful and I cried because I, um, and I prayed because I can't overcome fear and I can't overcome anybody else's decisions without mm -hmm. something guiding me. And so why was I fearful? Like, first of all, there's a lot of layers to that too. The initial sure. and immediate one is that I've lived a lifetime wanting to be able to do what I'm doing at this very moment. This is a dream come true for me to be talking to you about pro wrestling, to be involved in the world of professional wrestling, to be on a, a like a nationally televised wrestling product. This is my dream come true. And it so happens that the National Wrestling Alliance, which is offering me this great opportunity, does most of our television tapings in Nashville, Tennessee, in the heart of a place that has chosen that by my existence, I'm a danger to somebody's child. So I was just overcome with sadness. And I'm still trying, if I'm completely transparent, I'm still trying to pull myself out of that because it's a big rug to have pulled from beneath your feet, to have the prospect of your dreams just evaporating, something you've worked really long and hard for evaporating. So that's my personal, but but when we look at this in a more expansive way, this is so frustrating at a minimum and appalling at a maximum. The reason I say it's frustrating, first of all, the legislation that was passed is super, super, super vague. Mm -hmm. The wording of that legislation is incredibly, incredibly vague. And that in itself opens the opportunities for abuses, or misinterpretations or misapplications of that legislation. Mm -hmm. And for people who are listening, who may not think that, who, who may not, may actually agree with that legislation, may agree with like that drag should not be something that's in, done in public or what have you. Like the problem with such lax legislation in terms of its verbiage is that the common person in society adheres pretty well to most laws because they're pretty cut and dry. Like when I drive down the highway, it says do not exceed 65 miles an hour. It does not say do not exceed an acceptable speed because yeah. then whose acceptable speed is it? Like to me, right. I'm like, I'm driving, I'm in control of my car. I'll go 90. That's acceptable to me, but it's not acceptable to the law. With something like this, it becomes so open-ended that if people you know, choose not to apply it, um, really stringently, then a lot of things are permissible. But if there are people who do want to really crack down, and this opens it to personal biases, like if people have predisposed biases or do not want something to be a way that's not acceptable in their own mind, they can crack down. And it's going to open a lot of presumably pretty frivolous lawsuits. And it endangers the identities of people who, whom who are we as a society to determine what is like gender conforming attire or not gender conforming attire? Because right. honestly, Renee, like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, women were not allowed to wear pants. That was not gender conforming jeans yeah. and jeans were not gender conforming. Uh, you know, girls had to wear skirts or dresses. Um, and, you know, it's just, Super problematic, but even more so, Renee, one of the things that that I find so distressing about this is the implication and the way it was passed that LGBTQ people 
or drag performers are predators who are preying on children. That part is beyond distressing. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to explain to you a tweet that I sent out um, maybe a week or 10 days ago. And I it was about a youth pastor in a Texas church who had been um, revealed to be molesting children for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And my tweet passed that on, but my my quote on that was, the drag people need to be concerned with are sheeps are, are wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing is the kind of drag it, any parent, and I applaud parents who want to protect their children. They should. But the reality is I am underneath all of this an openly and very flamboyantly gay man. You can see me coming a mile away. Therefore, if you are a concerned parent, you gently guide your child away from my path. And I'm not concerned about your children. You are not going to inadvertently have me in your life. You are not going to have most of my friends who do drag inadvertently in your life where you are unsuspecting of who they are. Mm -hmm. We are very open and forthright about who we are, what we do. And therefore, it allows parents the judicious opportunity to parent their own children. And unfortunately, people who are truly predators, the last thing they want you to know is they are a predator. Mm -hmm. They are going to do everything to make you believe that they are the person like who would do this. It's the same thing with any kind of like, there are people in society who like you see them coming and you're like, that's a criminal. I'm not, I'm going right. to my purse or whatever. And then there are significant numbers, more people who are found to be predatory because of the very fact that they fly under society's radar. They are the least- And being uh, in disguise as people that are helping children and being there as a beacon for them and trying to steer them in the right path. Like it's, it's jaw drop, jaw dropping. It's so scary. As a parent to imagine something like that happening, like I just can't wrap my head around it. And you know, you are a parent and the, the I'm not a parent, but I, the closest thing in my life, I have two nephews and a niece who I'm obsessively in love with because they are just gorgeous adults now. And the two nephews, like one just had this beautiful baby six months ago and the other one has a baby on the way. And I understand any parent out there who loves their children and wants to protect them. And I think when it comes to the nitty gritty of this, like drag queen story hour or drag queens in public, as any parent, you have the judicious right of parenting where you can choose whether or not your child is in the presence of or not in the presence of someone, anyone in public, right? Like yeah. there's not a situation that I've ever heard of where a six-year-old child woke up one day and drove themselves to the drag show because <laughs> they just had to have drag queen story hour or they just needed to see that yeah. contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. like, just like, um, you know, there's a greater chance, honestly, of your child sneaking into an R-rated movie and seeing something than accidentally going to a drag show without your knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. And um, because... <laughs> If you put your child inside like the movie theater, they can sneak from one. I did this. I'm a product of this. I snuck in and saw boobs for the first time, like in 1970s. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my God. Total recall. Holy shit. Oh my God. Exactly. I saw three <laughs> boobs. Um, you know, it's one of those things where this is a situation where I am sometimes confounded because I think many of the people who would support this very legislation are the same people which mind you, when I say support this legislation, I mean, it's determining for all parents what is acceptable for children or not acceptable for children, what is appropriate or not appropriate. Though most of the people who would kind of push this kind of legislation would be the same people who would presumably say that um, a school could not require their child to do reading that they don't approve of. Right. So what I'm saying here is that they 
though many of the individuals who would support something like this would give a line item veto opportunity. Like, well, you know, must you demonize all people if some parents actually do want to take their children to this? And what about the instance of people who are LGBTQ parents where this is pretty common? It's always about this thing where they've deemed us deemed us as a community now to be groomers it's such a it's such a crazy label to slap on your community like it's so damning to say that and to put that on you like it's it's so upsetting i'm gonna give you uh, oh my god i did not i wanted to talk about wrestling and happy things but un unfortunately this is part of my wrestling experience right now this is defining my ability to work i had opportunities presenting to me in numerous southern states and they've suddenly evaporated because of this conversation. Wow. And I don't blame the promoters because why invite, you know what I mean? Like now there is something for some people to like really throw a fit about. Oh gosh. But, wow. But, because yeah, I mean, because some of the different states, I mean, they they're what their um their licenses will get taken away. People will be facing jail time. Like there's so many really scary repercussions for this. And unfortunately, right now we're in such the early phases of it. We do not know what those will be. Exactly. So everybody's like really fearful. Who's going to be the first example? Who's going to, where is this going to go? Oh my but gosh. That term groomer, um, I have such a different perspective on it. Um, first of all, I think that like the, the, the idea of grooming, meaning preparing like a, a person to accept unacceptable behavior later in life or become a victim, um, you know, that is based in the idea of brainwashing. And when I look at things like hatred and bigotry and racism and homophobia and transphobia, those are all learned acts. And those are things that those parents are actually grooming their children for. They are grooming their children to carry those forward. And one of the things in my personal opinion that makes drag queens so threatening to certain types of individuals isn't the fear that we're going to molest their children because the proven facts are there that we do not do that. Mm -hmm. Though That is far more prevalent within heterosexual communities, religious communities, various other sort of indoctrinized communities than it is in mine. So the reason I think that they're, what they're concerned about us grooming their children to do, they're concerned that because I am glamorous and funny and like look like a, uh, you know, a brought to life Bratz doll or, uh, you know, a brought to life vampire high character or Barbie doll or whatever, um, a Muppet, um, that their children will be groomed to question whether or not people who are different, who appear different, who appear to break the conformity of what they're taught, they will begin to question whether those people truly are bad because I enjoyed my experience with this person. Those people make me happy. Mm -hmm. And it begins to erode the kind of strength and hold that many of those parents have on their own children and people who want to push forward an ideology of hatred and bigotry and closed-mindedness know that their entire ideology rests on people continuing to believe in those ideologies. If you begin to think that gay people not, might not be horrible or incredibly different, but they actually can be contributing members of society and fun and interesting and witty, and talented, that's a problem. If you begin to think that Black people, African-American people can be phenomenally talented, educated, that they are contributors, then that begins to erode that type of racism. Mm -hmm. All of these things, if you begin to believe that women do not need to stay at home and procreate, that they can contribute to the world, that erodes that ideology. And before very long, the people who are bringing these children into the world and passing these thoughts that are so harmful in society forward, the children start to throw them away. And there is no greater source of grooming their child for something that they do not want than to break them from their own thought process. 
Fucking round of applause. Honestly, like the way that you've been able to sum all of this up, and obviously it's a very passionate subject for you, uh, but I'm so happy to have you on to express your feelings about this, to really have a platform to get out there and talk about it because it is such a scary time. And God, just within the last couple of years, just the the way that the government is working, the way the world is working can be such a scary time for for so many different communities. We've seen what has recently happened for women and the rights for our own bodies with with Absolutely. what your community is going going through right now. It's it's such a scary horrible time that just like it just makes us kind of throw our hands up and I think the more we can talk about stuff and educating people I think you know having other resources for people to be educated and I don't know it's 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 scary because I don't know what else you can do like I don't know what else to do except to talk about it and to try to have these conversations because it does feel like your hands are tied and it feels like it's out of our hands it's it's awful it's beyond that too it's like it's out of our hands and it's in a process that I think it's in a political process that I honestly think people on both sides are utterly disenchanted with at this moment. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. we, you know, and what we're seeing is truly starting to be frightening because it's things that I thought I would never see in you think my you're life. You're moving right. forward. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what is happening? Like, I cannot believe in 2023, the things that we're hearing. We just overturned the reproductive rights. You know, we that has gone to the wayside, which has been around all of my life, certainly all of your life and yeah. most of the listeners' lives. Yeah. That was a right that we, you know, we've debated, but we presumably never thought it would be changed. This drag ban um, is bringing with it some additional things that, that I believe are being mm, positioned to target LGBTQ people specifically, mm -hmm. such as applications for marriages, because, you know, marriage equality. And so applications yeah. for marriage have been targeted um, with the idea that, for example, if you are working a clerk of courts or something, and it's against your own religious beliefs, that you do not have to approve marriage licenses for LGBTQ people. That is up now for con in conversation for like legislation. Holy shit. Oh First my of all, God. let me just say, if you, if your religious beliefs um, prevent you from doing your job, that means you're in the wrong job. Like, sure. I, you know, that means you're in the wrong job. But furthermore, what people don't understand is if that actually moves forward, um, those same person who could prevent me and a partner from marrying based on religious beliefs that, you know, same gender, same sex marriages should not be legal. That person, it's about their personal application of judicious decision making. So that could also be interfaith relationships if they don't believe oh in that. That's, that could God. be the thing. What it could be interracial relationships. It literally bases it on anything that they could say that their religion, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. does not yep. support. Yeah, and it becomes you know a situation where it the 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 religion becomes a shroud, and it's unfortunate that someone in 2023 should be reminded of this, but we were built on a separation of church and state. And therefore what anybody's religious or spiritual practices are, should not be anywhere reflected in the law. That is th those are two separate things. And um, I don't, I could go on a whole thing here, but I'm in just a loving kind, uh, glamorous pro wrestling um, <laughs> personality. You know, yeah. like I don't, I don't like to talk about those things even though I feel obligated to, because as I said, my very existence, is, my very effective, existence yes. is politicized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not by my choice. I just want to go out there and be ringside for Thrillbilly Silas Mason. Hell yes. Pursuit for the NWI national championship, <laughs> which we were going to take from that national champion Sion. <laughs> I love that I was able to have you on here and that we did get to talk a bunch of wrestling. I like that we tackled some real serious subjects and you spoke about it so um, educated so beautifully. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, okay. And I guess a, g a great way to wrap this up, I know it's coming up, but you've got Effie's uh, big gay brunch coming up. Um, what can we expect there to just wrap it up on a nice note? So I've got so many things coming up. I'm going to be at WrestleCon uh -huh. on March 31st. I'm going to be at Effie's big gay brunch on the 1st of April. 
Um, and then I'm going to be at a, a opening uh, the dip West Coast Los Angeles premiere of Out in the Ring, which is a documentary film about LGBTQ oh, cool. representation and influence on the world of professional wrestling. So those are all coming up. Um, NWA is going to be in Chicago on April 7th and 8th. We've got a pay-per-view, 312, on the 7th, which is a Friday. 8th is two days of TV tapings. But I am undoubtedly booked and super, busy. Super looking forward to Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Renee, one of the things I always try to do at Big Gay Brunch is I, again, like I look to these people in the world of wrestling who for me were legends. Um, Right behind me, right here is a Sherry Martell <laughs> SummerSlam 92 outfit collectible. And I know when I see that, what that event was because I'm such a fan and that's an iconic look. So I always try to present an iconic look because I want people to say, that was what Poyo Delmar looked like at Effie's Big A Brunch 2 in Tampa. That's what she looked like at 3 in Chicago. So I God, have- I need to think about my outfits like that. That's smart. It's, but it's, I think only, and, and you do, but only like you're on a, like every, you're just going and going, going. It's different for me. These are like Effie's Big A Brunch to the wrestling community that is my most staunch supporters. That is our- uh, WrestleMania and our SummerSlam. You Hell know what yeah. I mean? Like, Hell that yeah. are like all out in full gear. Like you know, <laughs> those are our those are our big big events. Time um, to let her rip. And so I spend months sometimes. Like, uh, obviously when it's feasible, I will tie it to the city. Like we were in Dallas last year, and I was Dallas Cowboys cheerleader, and oh, I yeah. put months into that. And then we were in Chicago, and I couldn't really come up with any idea that I wanted for Chicago, so I was just like. Um, leopard print diva and I've got something in mind for for Los Angeles for this big gay brunch um, that I think after, especially after our conversation today will make a lot more sense we are okay. just holding, we are holding out for a hero and love it okay oh I'm, I can't wait to see and maybe I can be that person for you even for just one morning's brunch I cannot wait to see what the look is, see it all come together. Uh, Poyo, thank you so much for coming on here and uh, just speaking so eloquently on so many different things. You're an absolute star. Uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you putting the look together. Chef's kiss. Mm. So great to see you. Yes. Flap it out there. <laughs> I, I'm I'm honored. You know, I, I'm so honored, Renee. I told you this privately. I'm going to say it again because I really believe it, that there's a lot of people who have podcasts, there's a lot of people that your listeners could choose to listen to, but they choose to listen to you because it's the difference between watching Jerry Springer and watching Oprah. You know, Oprah I is going to give you, I love you, I love you. I love you. There's going to give you something. They're going to, uh, Oprah gives you an emotional connection. Jerry, Jerry Springer gives you a lot of sizzle and a lot of drama, but you do not leave that show really feeling connected to anybody. I listen to your interviews and I feel like you, I feel like I'm eavesdropping on two friends that are just chit-chatting. And in many of your cases, they really, really are. They are, I know. <laughs> in our case, not as much, but I, we could be, if you want to be, we could be, we could be girlfriends. Listen, sign a girl up. I'm with <laughs> you. Let's do it. I'm going to start sending out my outfits to you for approval. Oh my God, please. <laughs> need my approval. You're, you always look so gorgeous as we started off saying. <laughs> Uh, well, you are, you're such a dream, honestly. Thank you so much for coming on and hopefully I'll see you sooner than later. I, I hope so. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All of them crossed. All right. I'll let you get back to your day. I'm going to go tend to my child and see what else needs to be done around this house. But I, I really appreciate you hopping on here. I mean, now that I throw on this mascara, I might as well run to the store. Might as well run a couple <laughs> errands.